The study of nuclear structure during this century has opened up broad vistas of nuclear energy application. Scientists of many different disciplines and nationalities have made possible this extraordinary development. In this account, we shall attempt to trace how the contributions of some of these men in this century of the atom have linked together to form a chain of scientific progress, the end of which is not yet in sight. We shall begin at the time when man first started to comprehend the true nature of the structure of matter. Less than two months after the birth of the United Nations and UNESCO, and very influential in the early development of these two organizations, of course, was the revelation that men could release the enormous energy of nuclear fission. With this discovery came the realization that it would only be a matter of time, and a relatively short time at that, before we would have at our disposal enough energy and the technologies for using it either to completely destroy our civilization or lift it to great new standards. The voice of Dr. Glenn Seaborg, Nobel Laureate, Chairman of the United States Atomic Energy Commission, a man whose contributions have done much to increase man's understanding of the atom. Dr. Seaborg will help tell the story, calling upon the voices of some of the men whose names have become legend in the annals of nuclear science. At the beginning of the 19th century, John Dalton postulated a theory that was to become a powerful stimulus for research into the nature of the chemical elements and their constituent parts. Centuries before Dalton, men had speculated that all matter was composed of fundamental building blocks. By making measurements of what we now know of as atomic weights, Dalton transformed this abstraction into tangible concepts of chemical molecules and constituent chemical atoms. This theory prepared the way for the identification of individual chemical elements, and by the mid-19th century, about 75 such elements were known. It became apparent that chemical elements differ in their properties in a systematic fashion in relation to their atomic weights. In 1869, the Russian chemist Dmitry Mendeleev called attention to the systematic nature of these relationships and published his periodic table of the elements, which not only arrayed the then existing family of, of elements, but provided a basis for predicting the discovery of ones not yet identified. In 1834, when Michael Faraday reviewed his work on electrolysis and the nature of electricity, he suggested that atoms of like chemical elements have equal quantities of electricity associated with them. This implied the existence of discrete particles of electricity, or in short, electrons. In 1897, J.J. Thompson, working in the Cavendish Laboratory in Cambridge, confirmed the existence of the electron and was able to measure its charge. Here, in a historic recording, Thompson describes his discovery. First sight seem more impractical than a body which can only exist in vessels from which all but a minute fraction um, of the air has been uh, extracted, which is so small that its mass is an insignificant fraction of the mass of an atom of hydrogen, which itself is so small that a crowd of these atoms, equal in number to the population of the whole world, would be too small to have been detected by any means then known to science. 
In a related field of study, Wilhelm Conrad Rentgen, in 1895, reported finding a penetrating radiation that passed through glass and paper to cause a glow on paper coated with barium platinocyanide. He described the phenomenon as X-rays. Their nature was unknown. Rentkin's discovery of X-rays was followed in 1896 by experiments by the French physicist André Becquerel, experiments which showed that minerals containing uranium emitted a penetrating radiation that could also fog a sensitive photographic plate, even when that plate was protected by heavy black paper. His discovery of natural radioactivity was reinforced by Marie and Pierre Curie, who found that the element thorium had radioactive qualities similar to uranium. The Curie's research on natural radioactivity led them to the discovery of polonium and radium, elements even more radioactive than thorium or uranium. The findings of Rentkin, Becquerel, and the Curies stimulated further research into the nature of radioactivity, and in 1899, Ernest Rutherford, studying the radiations emitted by a uranium compound, identified alpha and beta rays. In the following year, Pierre Villard reported that a different type of radiation from radium preparations darkened a photographic plate, even through a thick shield of iron or lead. This radiation, which unlike alpha and beta radiation, could not be deflected by a magnetic field, was later identified as gamma rays. In 1900, beta radiation was shown to consist of particles identical to electrons. And in 1903, Rutherford proved that alpha rays consist of positively charged particles, later found to be helium nuclei. Rutherford and his co-workers, men such as Frederick Soddy, Hans Geiger, Niels Bohr, explored radioactivity and the nature of the atom. In 1903, Rutherford and Soddy described radioactive decay as natural transmutation. The voice of Ernest Rutherford. A great change in our ideas resulted from the discovery of the electron and of the spontaneous radioactivity observed in the heavy elements, uranium and thorium. Soddy and I were able to show in 1903 uh, that radioactivity was a sign and measure of the instability of atoms, and that the atoms of uranium and thorium were undergoing a series of spontaneous transformations. At about the same point in time, in what then seemed to be an unrelated development, Albert Einstein postulated one of history's most important ideas, namely that a fundamental relationship exists between mass and energy. Here is Albert Einstein discussing this idea. It followed from the special theory of relativity that mass and energy are both are but different manifestations of the same thing, a somewhat unfamiliar conception for the average mind. Furthermore, the equation E is equal mc square, in which energy is put equal to mass multiplied with the square of the velocity of light, showed that very small amount of mass may be converted into a very large amount of energy, and vice versa. The mass and energy were, in fact, equivalent according to the formula mentioned above. More than two decades were to pass before the formula E equal mc squared took on practical significance. As man's knowledge of radioactivity increased, it became necessary to create a new picture of the atom. And in 1912, Rutherford suggested that the atom consisted of a very small but heavily charged nucleus with one or more outer electrons. In 1913, Saudi formulated the concept of the isotope to describe stable and radioactive subdivisions of individual elements all occupying the same position in the periodic system. In 
In 1919, Rutherford achieved the first controlled artificial disintegration of a nucleus when he bombarded nitrogen atoms with alpha particles to form hydrogen atoms. The following year, Rutherford proposed the name proton. In the same year, 1920, work in the United States by W. D. Harkins, in Australia by Ormy Masson, in England by Rutherford, suggested the existence of a neutral particle in the nucleus. This hypothetical particle was later given the name neutron. In 1932, James Chadwick confirmed experimentally the idea of the neutron as a consistent part of nuclear structure. Thus, all the basic building blocks of the atom were now known. The first nuclear transmutations using neutrons were reported in 1932 by N. Feather in England and W. D. Harkins, D. M. Gans, and H. W. Newson in the United States, using fast neutrons to bombard nuclei of nitrogen, oxygen, fluorin, and neon. The discovery of the neutron resulted in a surge of activity in nuclear physics since the uncharged particle could approach much closer to charged nuclei than other particles. One of the men who took part in and observed that activity was Otto Frisch. In Germany, nuclear physics was present in several places. There was the team of Hahn and Meissner, who had been one of the first group to study radioactive elements. Hahn was working on various applications of radioactivity for the study of chemical reactions and structures of uh, precipitates and things like that. Whereas Lisa Meister was using radioactive materials chiefly to elucidate the processes of beta and gamma emission and of the interaction of gamma rays with matter. Now, that year 1932, in which the neutron was discovered, has been rightly called the marvelous year of uh, physics, in which two more great discoveries were made. In this country, Lawrence made the first cyclotron that showed promise of being a useful instrument and in England, Cockroft and Walton built the first accelerator for protons capable of carrying out nuclear disintegration. Most of nuclear physics, as we know it, would never have come about without at least one of those two instruments. Things got really moving when, in 1934, artificial radioactivity was found by Curie and Joliot. As soon as this work became known, there was a rush to repeat and extend the experiments, but most of them rushed pretty well in the straight line indicated by Curie-Joliot, bombarding other elements with alpha particles. Fermi had at that time already decided in Rome that uh, nuclear physics was an important and interesting line, and he had started to set up some instrumentation. So when this discovery came along, he could get going quite fast to see whether neutrons would have that effect. Fermi, within about four weeks of the discovery by Joliot Curie, could publish the first results that various elements did become radioactive on bombarding with neutrons. And only one other month later, he announced that bombarding uranium produced some new radioactivities, and by that time, he felt sure that these must be transuranic elements. Mm -hmm. 
1934, Fermi and his associates created radioisotopes by bombardment of uranium with neutrons, which had been slowed to the thermal energies with a paraffin moderator. This and the discovery of transmutation by slow neutrons led eventually to the realization of nuclear fission just a few years later, and consequently to the practical possibility of utilizing nuclear energy. It remained, however, for the team of Otto Hahn, Lisa Meitner, and Fritz Strassmann to extend the experiments of Fermi. In January 1939, Hahn and Strassmann published the results of their bombardment of the uranium nucleus. Years later, Hahn discussed his collaboration with Strassmann and Lisa Meitner. In particular, Fermi concluded that by irradiating uranium with neutrons, we had formed transuranic elements, that is, elements of higher atomic number than uranium. Miss Lisa Meitner, Fritz Strassmann, and I decided to repeat and extend these very interesting experiments. We felt well qualified to do so. The physicist Lisa Meitner and I it worked together on problems of radioactivity for over 30 years. Fritz Strassmann, my friend, possessed unique expertise in analytical inorganic chemistry. And I had been in the field of radioactive chemistry from the early days of the beginning of the century, many years ago, with fairly good results. During the four years, the joint work from 1934 to 38, we published a number of papers, Meitner, Hahn, Schlossmann, believing that we had isolated isotopes of the elements 93 to 96, and our results were generally accepted. But toward the end of 1938, when Lisa Meitner had been compelled to leave Germany and had emigrated to Sweden, Dr. Strassmann and myself, we came to the startling conclusion that the impact of a neutron on a uranium nucleus caused it to undergo fission into two medium-sized nuclei, a process which had not been thought previously to be possible. These results, which we published with some hesitation, were confirmed very quickly by physicists in Denmark and the United States and other countries. The rest is well known. Lisa Meitner had remained in touch with Hahn. Before the publication of the results of their December experiments, Hahn had written of his puzzlement about those results to Lisa Meitner. Otto Frisch visited her in Sweden. When I came, she was uh, brooding over a letter of Hahn and showed me that result. And um, gradually, we came to the idea that perhaps one should not think of the nucleus being cleaved in half as with a chisel, but rather that perhaps there was something in Bohr's idea that the nucleus was like a liquid drop and that it could split. And then I worked out the way a surface tension of a nucleus was affected by charge. Lieder Meitner worked out the energies which would be available from the mass defect. She had the mass defect curve pretty well in her head. It turned out that the electrostatic repulsion would account for about the order of 200 MeV energy and that the mass defect curve would indeed deliver that energy so that the process could take place on a purely graphical basis without having to invoke the crossing of a barrier, which of course could never have worked. After that, uh, we separated again. We only spent uh, about three days together, just around Christmas. Lita Meitner went back to Stockholm. I went back to Copenhagen and just managed to tell Bohr about the idea as he was catching his boat to the United States. And I remember how he slapped his head barely after I had started to speak and said, oh, what fools we have been. We ought to have seen that before. <laughs> 
but he hadn't, and nobody had. Lisa Knight and I composed a paper over the long-distance telephone between Copenhagen and Stockholm, and I remember that I told the whole story to Placek, who was in Copenhagen, because the astonishing thing is it hadn't even occurred to me to do an experiment. Placek said, why don't you use a cloud chamber to test this? And I said I didn't have a cloud chamber handy and I didn't think it would be easy, but I used an ionization chamber and as everybody knows, it was a very easy experiment. I was just lucky that I was with Lita Meitner when the news uh, came to us before they broke officially. And then it was really Placek who had to nudge me before I uh, did the crucial experiment, which I did on January 13th. By that time, my paper was nearly written, but I held, uh, held it back for another three days to write up the other paper, and then they were both sent to Nature at the same day, but Nature published one after the other. And I might still mention that the word fission occurs in the first paper and was suggested to me by an American biologist, William A. Arnold. <laughs> Enrico Fermi had preceded Bohr in leaving Europe to go to the United States. On Monday, January 16, 1939, two weeks after Fermi had disembarked in New York, Bohr arrived and immediately told his momentous news to a former pupil, John Wheeler of Princeton University. He also carried the news to Columbia, where one of the first persons he met was Herbert Anderson. Anderson recalled those early days of 1939 at a memorial dinner years after he first met Bohr. On January 2nd, 1939, Fermi arrived in the country. On the 16th of the same month, uh, Bohr arrived and uh, brought with him the news of the fission process and uh, also uh, something about the, the Frisch uh, Meitner experiment. Bohr came to Columbia, and he was looking for Fermi. And uh, as he walked into one of the laboratories, expecting to see Fermi there, he didn't find Fermi, but he found me. And uh, although he didn't know who I was, he was so full of his news that he grabbed me by the shoulder and he said, listen, young man, I want to tell you about something that's very important uh, that's recently happened in physics and proceeded to lecture me on the fission process for about uh, one hour, and then he had to leave. <clears throat> well, I felt that uh, I really ought to find Fanny. I didn't know him very well, but I thought I ought to find him and to tell him that Bo was looking for him and to tell him a little bit about what I'd been told. And so I went to Fanny's office, uh, and uh, he was there. And I said that Professor Bohr had been looking for him, and he wanted to tell him about the fission process. And then Fanny, who never could listen very long to what you were telling him, proceeded to tell me again about fission and how it would work. Anderson became Fermi's graduate student and worked with him for many years. The honor of being the first scientist in the United States to witness uranium fission went to John Dunning of Columbia University. On the evening of January 25th, 1939, the night before Bohr and Fermi were to speak at a physics conference in Washington, Dunning followed up on the news carried by Bohr. With Francis Slack and Eugene Booth, he fired neutrons at a uranium-covered plate and watched as the energy of nuclear fission was recorded on his monitoring instruments. It was an experiment that many others were to repeat in the months ahead. At the physicists' conference, Bohr announced the details and the interpretation of the hahn strassmann experiments, and Fermi suggested that neutrons might be emitted in the process of nuclear fission. At that time, it was only a guess, but the implication of a possible chain reaction was obvious, 
even though that term was not mentioned. Scientists immediately began to explore the possibilities of fission. There was reason to believe that U-235 was the most readily fissionable isotope of uranium. And so some scientists concentrated on separating it from the other uranium isotopes, thereby producing what we now call enriched uranium. Others, notably Fermi, concentrated on achieving a chain reaction with natural uranium, the only form of the element then available. Here is Anderson on that subject. Fermi told me at the time that the quickest way to the chain reaction and all its consequences was to make a chain reaction, and that could probably be done uh, uh, first and most easily uh, by the techniques most familiar to him uh, using uh, natural uranium. And so we launched on a, a career of trying, first of all, to see whether neutrons were emitted and in what number, and a great deal of emphasis was placed on the quantitative aspects of the subject. The paper, The Production of Neutrons in Uranium Bombarded by Neutrons by Anderson, Fermi, and Hanstein was uh, submitted to the Physical Review one month after that, March 16, 1939, and then appeared in the April 15th issue. And this showed that indeed neutrons were emitted and in fairly copious uh, numbers. Experiments were a little bit on the rough side, but one could conclude from that experiment that one and a half neutrons were emitted from uranium for each thermal neutron that was absorbed by uranium, and that was a very important number, and not really very far from what is now known to be the value of that number, it was about 1.33. Uh, experiments were also being done, in fact, they always seem to be about a week or so ahead of us, by Joliot, Halbon, and Kowarski in working in Paris, under very difficult conditions, and at the same time, and going on in the same laboratory at Columbia, a Szilard had gotten together with Zinn, and they also carried out an experiment demonstrating the emission of fast neutrons when uranium absorbed a thermal neutron. <laughs> Fermi's ideas on neutron emission were quickly confirmed by scientists in the United States and France. Booth, Dunning, and Slack in the United States, and scientists in Denmark, then established that neutron emission involved the release of some delayed neutrons. The fact that two or three neutrons are released, and that some are delayed, meant that a chain reaction was possible and could be controlled. At Columbia, at Chicago, at many research centers, scientists pooled their efforts to work toward that goal. Meanwhile, the University of California's Lawrence Radiation Laboratory, with its two cyclotrons, was the scene of research into the possibilities of creating new elements heavier than uranium. The first such element, Neptunium, element 93, was discovered by Edwin McMillan and Philip Abelson in 1940. In an interview recorded many years later, Macmillan described his work. In brief, I bombarded uranium-238 with neutrons to see how far fission fragments travel. When I counted the radioactivity in the target uranium, I found an unexpected activity. The simplest interpretation of this observation was that the new activity resulted from the decay of uranium-239 made in the target by neutron capture. The new product would then be an isotope of element 93, which I later named neptunium. But it took a year more of work before the final proof came in experiments conducted by me and Dr. Philip H. Abelson. Soon after the discovery of Neptunium, a new team was formed to continue the search for the next higher element. This group, Macmillan, Joseph Kennedy, Arthur Wall and Glenn Seaborg discovered the fissionable transuranium element plutonium. Dr. Seaborg discusses that milestone. We were searching for element 94, and on December 14, 1940, we made our initial bombardment of uranium oxide plastered onto a grooved copper plate using the 60-inch cyclotron at Berkeley. 
Our plan was to search for an isotope of element 94 with a relatively short half-life, one that would produce a more rapid emission of alpha particles. We used a 16 MeV beam of deuterons from the cyclotron, hoping to find a detectable source of alpha particles to prove the existence of element 94. We put the material through a chemical procedure that would isolate element 93, hoping this would decay to element 94. We did find radioactivity that decayed to an isotope that emitted alpha particles, apparently an isotope of element 94. Ultimately, the isolation of element 94 required the chemical separation of the new element from all others, and Arthur Wall achieved that goal in February 1941. In March, uh, Kennedy, Wall, and myself, working with Emilio Segre, created and identified the fissionable isotope plutonium-239. It soon became evident that this highly fissionable element, in addition to its uses as a nuclear explosive and a nuclear fuel source, would also be valuable in future transuranium research. <laughs> While this work on transuranium elements had been advancing in California, great progress was being made on controlled nuclear fission. This culminated on December 2nd, 1942, in man's first controlled chain reaction. Arthur Compton recalls that day. We entered the balcony at one end of the room. On the balcony, a dozen scientists were watching the instruments and handling the controls. Across the room was a large cubical pile of graphite and uranium blocks in which we hoped the atomic chain reaction would develop. Inserted into openings in this pile of blocks were control and safety rods. After a few preliminary tests, Fermi gave the order to withdraw the control rod another foot. We knew that that was going to be the real test. The Geiger counters registering the neutrons from, from the reactor began to click faster and faster till their sound became a rattle. Then you could begin to see the spot of light reflected from the galvanometer that measured the ionization current begin to move. At first slowly, then faster, and still faster. The, re the reaction grew until there might be danger from the radiation up on the platform where we were standing. Throw in the safety rods came Fermi's order, and you could see the pointer move right back to zero. The rattle of the counters fell to a slow series of clicks. For the first time, atomic power had been released. It had been controlled and stopped. Only half a watt of energy. Infinitesimal, but it showed that men had the boundless energy of atomic fission under control. Somebody handed Fermi a bottle of Italian wine and a little chair went up. <laughs> Ten years after the Chicago experiment, Fermi recalled that he had never been in doubt about its success. The experiment in which the first uh, self-sustaining chain reaction was obtained had been preceded by a great number of other experiments and calculations which had made uh, virtually certain that once the so-called critical dimensions were achieved, the reaction would become a reality. Fermi's demonstration of controlled fission brought mankind to a new height of scientific achievement. It paved the way for the large-scale application of the products of nuclear energy, heat, and radiation. A series of developmental reactors followed Fermi's Chicago experiment, and it was to ship repulsion that nuclear power was first applied. In 1954, Nautilus, the world's first nuclear-powered submarine, was launched. Six years later, the submarine Triton gave a dramatic demonstration of nuclear propulsion capability in a round-the-world trip completely underwater, tracing the historic route of the explorer Magellan. In 1962, Savannah, the world's first nuclear-powered merchant vessel, went to sea in a demonstration of commercial vessel propulsion. However, the most basic use of nuclear power has been in the generation of electricity, 
Work on Central Station nuclear power started in the United States in the late 1940s, began to gather momentum in the mid-1950s, and has been accelerating ever since. Through the cooperative efforts of the United States government and the electric power industry, the development advanced rapidly from the reactor experiment stage through the successive stages of piloting and demonstration of prototype facilities, some of commercial size, on utility systems. By the mid-1960s, United States utilities were contracting for large commercial nuclear power plants on competitive economic bases, and by 1969, the first of these plants was on the line. At the start of 1971, the United States commitment to nuclear power amounted to some 90,000 megawatts, which is expected to grow to at least 150,000 megawatts by the end of this decade. It may lend perspective to these figures to note that the total electric generating capacity of the United States from all sources, hydroelectric, thermal, and internal combustion, did not pass the 150,000 megawatt mark until 1958. It is more than a coincidence that nuclear power's massive breakthrough into the nation's electric power market came at a time of awakening interest in the quality of our environment and of realization that our fossil fuel reserves are finite. As an environmentally attractive and potentially abundant energy source, nuclear power is destined to play an ever more important role in the nation's energy economy in the years and decades ahead. At the physicists' conference, Bohr announced the details and the interpretation of the hahn strassmann experiments, and Fermi suggested that neutrons might be emitted in the process of nuclear fission. At that time, it was only a guess, but the implication of a possible chain reaction was obvious, even though that term was not mentioned. Scientists immediately began to explore the possibilities of fission. There was reason to believe that U-235 was the most readily fissionable isotope of uranium. And so, some scientists concentrated on separating it from the other uranium isotopes, thereby producing what we now call enriched uranium. Others, notably Fermi, concentrated on achieving a chain reaction with natural uranium, the only form of the element then available. Here is Anderson on that subject. Fermi told me at the time that the quickest way to the chain reaction and all its consequences was to make a chain reaction, and that could probably be done uh, uh, first and most easily uh, by the techniques most familiar to him uh, using uh, natural uranium. And so we launched on a, a career of trying, first of all, to see whether neutrons were emitted and in what number, and a great deal of emphasis was placed on the quantitative aspects of the subject. The paper, The Production of Neutrons in Uranium Bombarded by Neutrons by Anderson, Fermi, and Hanstein was uh, submitted to the Physical Review one month after that, March 16, 1939, and then appeared in the April 15th issue. And this showed that indeed neutrons were emitted and in fairly copious uh, numbers. Experiments were a little bit on the rough side, but one could conclude from that experiment that one and a half neutrons were emitted from uranium for each thermal neutron that was absorbed by uranium, and that was a very important number, and not really very far from what is now known to be the value of that number, it was about 1.33. Uh, experiments were also being done. In fact, they always seem to be about a week or so ahead of us by Joliot, Halbon, and Kowarski in working in Paris under very difficult conditions, and at the same time, and going on in the same laboratory at Columbia, a Szilard had gotten together with Zinn, and they also carried out an experiment demonstrating the emission of fast neutrons when uranium absorbed a thermal neutron. <laughs> ¶¶ 
Fermi's ideas on neutron emission were quickly confirmed by scientists in the United States and France. Both Dunning and Slack in the United States and scientists in Denmark then established that neutron emission involved the release of some delayed neutrons. The fact that two or three neutrons are released and that some are delayed meant that a chain reaction was possible and could be controlled. At Columbia, at Chicago, at many research centers, scientists pooled their efforts to work toward that goal. Meanwhile, the University of California's Lawrence Radiation Laboratory, with its two cyclotrons, was the scene of research into the possibilities of creating new elements heavier than uranium. The first such element, Neptunium, element 93, was discovered by Edwin McMillan and Philip Abelson in 1940. In an interview recorded many years later, Macmillan described his work. In brief, I bombarded uranium-238 with neutrons to see how far fission fragments travel. When I counted the radioactivity in the target uranium, I found an unexpected activity. The simplest interpretation of this observation was that the new activity resulted from the decay of uranium-239 made in the target by neutron capture. The new product would then be an isotope of element 93, which I later named neptunium. But it took a year more of work before the final proof came in experiments conducted by me and Dr. Philip H. Abelson. Soon after the discovery of neptunium, a new team was formed to continue the search for the next higher element. This group, Macmillan, Joseph Kennedy, Arthur Wall, and Glenn Seaborg, discovered the fissionable transuranium element plutonium. Dr. Seaborg discusses that milestone. We were searching for element 94, and on December 14, 1940, we made our initial bombardment of uranium oxide plastered onto a grooved copper plate using the 16 cyclotron at Berkeley. Our plan was to search for an isotope of element 94 with a relatively short half-life, one that would produce a more rapid emission of alpha particles. We used a 16 MeV beam of deuterons from the cyclotron, hoping to find a detectable source of alpha particles to prove the existence of element 94. We put the material through a chemical procedure that would isolate element 93, hoping this would decay to element 94. We did find radioactivity that decayed to an isotope that emitted alpha particles, apparently an isotope of element 94. Ultimately, the isolation of element 94 required the chemical separation of the new element from all others, and Arthur Wall achieved that goal in February 1941. In March, uh, Kennedy, Wall, and myself, working with Emilio Segre, created and identified the fissionable isotope plutonium-239. It soon became evident that this highly fissionable element, in addition to its uses as a nuclear explosive and a nuclear fuel source, would also be valuable in future transuranium research. <laughs> While this work on transuranium elements had been advancing in California, great progress was being made on controlled nuclear fission. This culminated on December 2nd, 1942, in man's first controlled chain reaction. Arthur Compton recalls that day. We entered the balcony at one end of the room. On the balcony, a dozen scientists were watching the instruments and handling the controls. Across the room was a large cubical pile of graphite and uranium blocks in which we hoped the atomic chain reaction would develop. Inserted into openings in this pile of blocks were control and safety rods. After a few preliminary tests, Fermi gave the order to withdraw the control rod another foot. We knew that that was going to be the real test. The Geiger counters registering the neutrons from, from the reactor began to click faster and faster till their sound became a rattle. Then you could begin to see the spot of light reflected from the galvanometer that measured the ionization current begin to move. At first slowly, then faster, and still faster. 
the, re the reaction grew until there might be danger from the radiation up on the platform where we were standing. Throw in the safety rods came Fermi's order. And you could see the pointer move right back to zero. The rattle of the counters fell to a slow series of clicks. For the first time, atomic power had been released. It had been controlled and stopped. Only half a watt of energy. Infinitesimal, but it showed that men had the boundless energy of atomic fission under control. Somebody handed Fermi a bottle of Italian wine and a little chair went up. Ten years after the Chicago experiment, Fermi recalled that he had never been in doubt about its success. The experiment in which the first uh, self-sustaining chain reaction was obtained had been preceded by a great number of other experiments and calculations which had made virtually certain that once the so-called critical dimensions were achieved, the reaction would become a reality. Fermi's demonstration of controlled fission brought mankind to a new height of scientific achievement. It paved the way for the large-scale application of the products of nuclear energy, heat, and radiation. A series of developmental reactors followed Fermi's Chicago experiment, and it was to ship repulsion that nuclear power was first applied. In 1954, Nautilus, the world's first nuclear-powered submarine, was launched. Six years later, the submarine Triton gave a dramatic demonstration of nuclear propulsion capability in a round-the-world trip completely underwater, tracing the historic route of the explorer Magellan. In 1962, Savannah, the world's first nuclear-powered merchant vessel, went to sea in a demonstration of commercial vessel propulsion. However, the most basic use of nuclear power has been in the generation of electricity. Work on Central Station nuclear power started in the United States in the late 1940s, began to gather momentum in the mid-1950s, and has been accelerating ever since. Through the cooperative efforts of the United States government and the electric power industry, the development advanced rapidly from the reactor experiment stage through the successive stages of piloting and demonstration of prototype facilities, some of commercial size, on utility systems. By the mid-1960s, United States utilities were contracting for large commercial nuclear power plants on competitive economic bases, and by 1969, the first of these plants was on the line. At the start of 1971, the United States' commitment to nuclear power amounted to some 90,000 megawatts, which is expected to grow to at least 150,000 megawatts by the end of this decade. It may lend perspective to these figures to note that the total electric generating capacity of the United States from all sources, hydroelectric, thermal, and internal combustion, did not pass the 150,000 megawatt mark until 1958. It is more than a coincidence that nuclear power's massive breakthrough into the nation's electric power market came at a time of awakening interest in the quality of our environment and of realization that our fossil fuel reserves are finite. As an environmentally attractive and potentially abundant energy source, nuclear power is destined to play an ever more important role in the nation's energy economy in the years and decades ahead. <laughs>